So the next section we're going to look at um, is looking at how um, we can actually investigate some of the things that are happening across the world. A variety of uh, atrocities that are being committed uh, by various nations. Uh, and the question of how do we actually use that and archive that material. Um, there's a lot of complicated questions to ask. We've already seen uh, Sam and Alexa discuss some of these questions. Um, I'm being joined by uh, a group who will present their work on the subject. Uh, we've got Emma Winberg, uh, myself of course, uh, Hadi al khatib from the Syrian Archive, and Christine Vavia from the Forensic Architecture, uh, who are now going to join us, and they are going to start presenting some of the work that they're doing, starting with Emma. Thank you. Hello everyone, um, my name is Emma Winberg. I'm from uh, an NGO called Media Rescue. Um, Media Rescue's mission is to build the resilience of communities uh, who are exposed to or vulnerable to conflict um, or natural disaster. And in Syria, uh, this has been um, a project called the White Helmets, which you may be more familiar with. In the White Helmets program, we have uh, raised, trained and sustained um, a, a volunteer crew of around 4,000 male and female volunteers who have been trained in the tasks associated with the delivery of civil defense. Civil defense is defined under international humanitarian law, but as you can see, there's a broad range of community-based services, which I suppose would be categorized um, most normally as emergency and essential services. Here you can see what civil defense is as defined under IHL. Um, it's a protection of the civilian population from natural disaster or conflict. It's helping the population to recover, and it's providing the condition for the population to thrive. What that looks like in practice is everything from rescues, which is what the White Helmets are best known for, to um, support to IDP populations, camp building and management, emergency burial of the dead, emergency utilities repair, basically whatever the hell the community needs, they're there to do it. The White Helmets come from within the communities they serve. They're highly trusted. They act as a sort of community safety net for communities that otherwise have very little um, by way of protection. And uh, I suppose perhaps one of the things that defines them in Syria, which is possibly not adequately co covered by IHL, is that they're acting as a non-state actor. Um, IHL was conceived uh, at a time, or civil defense under IHL was conceived at a time when it was it was uh, intended to, be, to deal with interstate conflict. It is much less well equipped to deal with intrastate conflict, and we'll come back to some of the, uh, the consequences of that later. Here we are. So what, what is the contribution of the White Helmets to documentation? So uh, back in 2013, uh, we were conducting training in Turkey, um, predominantly of a, number, a, few, a small number of White Helmets teams. Quite quickly, the border, uh, border closures started becoming an issue, and the demand from within Syria was so great that we recognized a need to scale rapidly. That resulted in training of trainers who then went back inside Syria and started training. But for training purposes, we wanted to maintain um, quality control, and so we equipped them with helmet cameras and GoPros to enable them to film um, their operations. By 2014, this footage has started to become used by individual volunteers who started sharing this on Facebook um, for advocacy reasons, to show what was going on inside Syria. So what had started off as a training exercise had quickly become a method for distribution of content on right at the scene of incidents. So particularly for the rescue footage, um, this was taking place at a scene of a, bomb of a bombing, often of a civilian population or a center and um, hence the interest from human rights organizations who started to pick this up, and organizations such as, as Bellingcat who started to, to verify and validate the, the content that was being created. In 2015, um, training equipment was also given to volunteers, so specialist training within um, and the, the handling of and, and the, the processes around chemical weapons so that they could be compliant with OPC standards and so that they would understand chains of custody, et cetera, and those could be preserved. So what we've ended up with, in essence, is two types of documentation of relevance. The first one is documentary capture of video. That's what I've just, I, I think I've just run through. So why they're able to do it, they're highly distributed, 140 centers across Syria, 
Um, they are, uh, because they're first responders, they are naturally at the event. They are decentralized, which enables them to report very quickly. They don't have to put it through a sort of an organizational process where there's, there's controls. Instead, this is, this is highly decentralized. Um, and they're now in the process of trying to collate and archive this vast quantity of material to, to make it useful. Um, in terms of the physical capture of evidence, it's largely uh, two things. So it's the bur emergency burial of the dead um, and working with communities to retain some kind of records and identities of those who've been killed. And in the second one, some of the more high-profile work that they've done in support of the OPCW and in collecting evidence around chlorine and sarin use in Syria. Um, oops, sorry, Elliot. <laughs> What this has resulted in, I think the high-profile nature of this work has resulted in, and, and, and perhaps the credibility that it's generated by being authentic, um, has resulted in a sustained uh, disinformation campaign against white helmets, which you may have seen or experienced yourselves in your own feeds. But it is, it's vicious, and it follows the 4Ds pretty, pretty exactly. And so we've categorized some of the types of, of narratives into these four sections. Um, I think one of the, the, the key challenges for us at present is to understand how to make best use of what exists at this point in the conflict trajectory, where uh, White Helmet's activities are being squeezed across the, ac across the country. Um, the policy at present is to do as much of what we can, wherever we can, for as long as we can. But in the, I think, it's, I think everyone in this room will agree that we're in a, a phase of the conflict where we're having to look ahead and plan for the next phase, where it's less about trying to argue for sort of advocacy at, at present to act on Syria and rather to look at how do we best preserve what we do have and how do we capture that in the most meaningful and effective way that is, assists with future documentation and processes. So thank you very much. I will hand this back to Elliot. Um, so now we're going to take a look at what we actually do with this kind of footage. Um, I'm going to show you a video uh, made by The Guardian from White Helmet's footage that was collected after an incident. Um, I should warn you in this next section there are some fairly graphic images, uh, even though they're quite brief. Um, so to begin with, the, minute, uh, the video from The Guardian. <laughs> قام طيران الحرب الروسي بشن الغارة على مدينة سرنين فتبين أنه الغارة استهدفت مدرسة هي ملاصقة للمشفى الميداني ولله الحمد أن المدرسة كانت خارجة عن العمل بسبب القصف الصارخ بين المدرسة وكانت الدفاع المدني كانت قبل ما تشن الغارة سواء التقايد عم تطلب من الناس أنه تروح من المدرسة وأنا بالع... وأنا بالموقع أصور ال... الغارة فهون شن الطيران ضرب فاضطرب في الموقع اللي أنا فيه على بعد مترين أو ثلاث أمتار بها الصاروخ مني أو أنا وياه الصاروخ أنا حسيت أن جسمي بدي يتنزق من الضغط قابل الأرض كل الناس عم تسمع صوت عيال والناس ما ينتبه علي إنه فيهم واحد مصار كان في شخص يد السطر وحروق بإيد اليسار وشظايا بإيد اليمين وإيد اليسار بالإضافة إلى رطول في كل الجسم والصدر وشيء كبير بال بالخد بالفك السفلي إضافة إلى شخ بالعين الله أكبر مضطر أن تتوجه للموقع سواء أنت تعملك كموصي أو أنت عملك كرجل موقز أو مسعف لأنه في ناس بحاجتك So, um, following the media reports about this airstrike, um, the Russian Ministry of Defense published this image. Um, which it claims show the building in question, uh, the area in question, wasn't damaged in an airstrike. And um, this was dutifully reported by Russia today. 
It was a recently alleged that Russian jets destroyed a hospital in the city of Samin, uh, causing the Russian Defense Ministry to, uh, well, call on journalists to double-check the stories they publish. I call on the respected mass media not to jeopardize their reputation by publishing fakes like this. But it's not just the media. The accusations are actually picked up by the U.S. State Department. And to prove the hospital is t totally intact, uh, the Russian Defense Ministry provided up-to-date satellite photographs. The building on this image, dated October 31st, does not look like it was recently bombed. How can we tell if it's the hospital in Sarbin? A year ago, a video was posted on YouTube that shows the hospital under construction. Here's a screenshot from that year-old video. And here is the Washington Defense Ministry's aerial image of what it says is the hospital. We see a similar dome-shaped structure next to the building on both images. We see a wall or a fence positioned in a similar way. So where exactly is the hospital that Russia is accused of hitting? Um, so we've got two opposing versions of events. We've got footage of what looks like an airstrike. We've got the Russian Ministry of Defense saying there was no airstrike. Um, so how can we actually verify this? Well, first we need to actually check where this actually happened. So we can actually go to the city in question. We can take the Russian imagery and we can overlay it with the satellite imagery from the location in question. So we can see the Russian imagery is pointing to this location. We then take the footage from the white helmets and we use it to geolocate the footage of the white helmets. And we can see in this case, uh, first of all, the hostel is just off to the left-hand side of the frame in the white helmets footage. The um, location where the actual detonation happened, uh, the camera's pointing north, the actual camera position when the detonation happened is here. Um, but we start looking at the details in the imagery. So the right-hand side is Google Earth satellite imagery taken before the airstrikes occurred. So what we can see is this square building, uh, very distinctly in the satellite imagery, which is at the rear of the image. We can see these poles casting shadows, four regular shadows cast by poles here. And behind, we can see this very regularly shaped wall that we can also see behind it. Now let's go back to the footage of the airstrike. We can see the poles in the, here in the video, we can see the wall as well, and we can then see the airstrike happen. So we have uh, footage from the aftermath of that airstrike, and what we can actually see now is, again, the camera in this image is pointing in the same direction. Uh, we can now see that this regular structure that was there before has been reduced to a pile of rubble, completely gone. So you would no longer to expect to see this nice regular shape. You can see the poles next to it. Two of them have been knocked over, so you would no longer expect to see the four shadows. And to the left-hand side, we can see the wall that was there is now completely demolished. So let's take a look at the image presented by the Russian Ministry of Defense, supposedly after the airstrike had happened. What we can actually still see is the building that was completely destroyed is still standing. The four poles, two of which we can see were knocked over, are still standing. The wall is still there. What this tells us is the Russian image is not from after the airstrike, it's from before the airstrike. They have used as evidence that the airstrike didn't happen an image from before the airstrike had happened, and we can prove that using open source information. Um, another example we looked into of a hospital bombing was in Breaking Aleppo. Um, I showed you a clip from it earlier. Um, it was uh, no, uh, another one that the Russian Ministry of Defense claimed didn't happen. Um, this time they presented satellite imagery showing what they claimed was the hospital before uh, and after the dates of the bombings that were supposedly occurring there. And they were saying there was no damage visible to the structure. There were no changes to the facility. And that, it therefore, effectively proves that the people are lying. The eyewitnesses are not telling the truth. But again, we have lots of open source video. Uh, one example is this video from Al Jazeera Arabic. Um, this shows the hospital building after an airstrike on, on October 1st. Now, there are, in fact, three airstrikes on this location um, in a week. We can see the crater from the October 1st bombing very clearly. Um, and now the uh, camera is going around the rear of the building. And what we can see here is barrels that's been used to, as kind of a armor for the hospital, and then this area here where the ambulances would arrive. On the back wall is a camera, and it's this camera. And this is filming two days later on October 3rd. 
And you remember this footage from earlier that we showed you on the geolocation cha challenge. This is the moment of an airstrike two days after the Al Jazeera footage. So we can see from before and then after the airstrike the damage done to the building. But is that not visible from satellite imagery? Well, this might not be visible, but the crater that's outside the building almost certainly would be. This is a massive crater, pretty much on top of the previous cr crater from the October 1st airstrike. This is also something quite unusual. Very rarely do you get footage from before and after an airstrike in such a small period of time. So we can be certain that this is a new crater that appeared on October 3rd. So let's take a look at the Russian imagery. They're saying this shows no changes to the facility. But we can get our own commercial satellite imagery that's even better resolution than the Russian imagery. And if you look very carefully, what you can in fact see are differences. For example, this roof has partly collapsed between the two dates. And that's visible in the Russian imagery. You can also see this other roof has collapsed. Again, that's also visible in the Russian imagery. And it's also supported by footage from the ground. And finally, you can just make out the damage from the crater on the ground. So what's happened here? They haven't lied about the date or the location. They've just lied about what your eyes can see. You can see those things in the image if you actually look. Um, something else we've been doing a lot uh, recently is speaking to the International Criminal Court about their use of open source information. And in August 2017, this arrest warrant was issued um, for a commander in the army of General Haftar. He had been using his social media page to post images and photographs of executions he had been performing. He had posted six videos in total. Um, based off this, they had actually produced a, this arrest warrant. Um, and because they were all Facebook videos, anyone could go and find them. Um, so we started trying to geolocate some of these videos. And in video number six, we were actually able to find the precise location where these executions happened. I will warn you, this next section has some very strong footage in it. So this is video number six. He had started with just one person being executed. And by video six, he had rows and rows of people being executed. Um, we first took the video and extracted the stills from the video showing the different position of the cameras as it was moving around. So we could combine it into one image. And what that allowed us to do is see the whole area at once without having to cycle back and forth and start looking for details visible in the image. So for example, we could see just in the background some buildings, a wall, and a fork in the road. Not much to go by, but we could look at his Facebook page and see what else he'd been posting. So he had photographs of the fighting just before these executions took place, called the Chinese building area. And the buildings looked similar. So that was our first clue to start narrowing down the search location. The Chinese building area, though, is a very large area. But we knew there was the buildings in the area, a large empty space, a wall, and a fork in a road. Not much to go on to begin with but it gave us some possibilities of locations it could be. So we found this location, and we first started looking at the uh, details we could see. We could see, for example, the building was there, the wall is in the right place, there's a fork in the road, but what else is there? Well, we could see all these bushes in the video, and we could see them in the satellite imagery. So within uh, Google Earth, we could actually position the camera to match the position of the camera in the video. Now, watch the bushes as we, we merge them. We can see the bushes are in exactly the same position. But we what we discovered then was on the day of the execution, the satellite imagery shows these markings appear. And these markings line up with the blood pools from the execution. So we can say exactly where these executions took place, down to the blood pools that were produced by them, because they're visible on satellite imagery. But because we could actually see the precise location of the camera, we could make, get other information from this. So you can see the shadows that are being cast by the people in the video. We can actually use that as a sundial. So we can measure those, those shadows and get the precise time of day that the executions took place. And because we also have the satellite imagery, we can say that there was no blood stains on July 14th, but we, ha we had the first imagery from July 17th. That's when the blood stains had appeared. So it occurred between those two dates. And that's all based off that one video and the social media information that unit had been sharing about their activities. Um, so we collect all this information, but what do we do with all this vast amount of information? How do you make it useful and searchable? And this is what Hadi will be telling us next. Thanks a lot, Elliot. Uh, so I should just do it with. Yeah, agree. Right. Okay. Um, so, hello, everyone. My name is Hadi Al Khatib. Um, uh, I come from Syria, from Hama originally. And um, 
I work on human rights issues and technology since 2007. Uh, in 2011, when everything started in Syria, I, I left the country, I had to do military service, uh, so I went to Europe, I got my papers sorted out. And while in that period, in 2011, I was monitoring the situation in Syria uh, through user-generated content, so things that have been published on social media, as have Elliot showed us. Now, the thing with that is, um, it was since 2011 in Syria, the, the country was really closed. It was close to international human rights organizations, it was close to uh, UN institutions, governments, and so on. It was really hard for anyone to, do, to go to crime scenes and understand what's happening in the, in the conflict. This is the importance of user-generated content. This is exactly what Elliot has pre presented us in terms of the case studies and in terms of also of how institutions such as the ICC is, is using it right now. Um, so, in 2014, um, after I worked uh, in Turkey for about a year with lawyers, with prosecutors who were documenting human rights violations, getting materials in and out of Syria, um, we, we really needed a system to be able to make sure that all this material is not lost, all of it that is centralized and that there is a good way to deal with it. So this is what we started in 2014, is the Syrian archive, uh, the Syrian archive was uh, started to be able to collect, verify, uh, preserve, and investigate this visual documentation of human rights violations that happened in Syria since 2011. And uh, the aim of it is to be able to make sure that this material is, is used for building criminal cases or supporting criminal cases in terms of feeding this visual documentation, as well as uh, supporting advocacy research, so supporting the work of uh, human rights organizations, as well as, of course, for uh, uh, supporting any type of transitional justice and, and memory, uh, because the, old, the, the main issue that we are facing in Syria right now is a dysfunctioning international system that is not able to deal with the human rights violations that have been happening in 2011 until now. Um, and we realize that um, we really need to be working on different things in terms of legal advocacy, but at the end of the day, there is not much that until now we can do. So we really need to make sure that this material is available for the future uh, to be worked on when there is a way to be able to, to use it for advocacy or justice purposes. So since 2014, uh, we have been collaborating with, with many different organizations because with using user-generated content, we were facing huge challenges right now we are going to go through. And it was really hard for us as a, as a Syrian civil society groups to go over all this type of challenges using user-generated content. So we collaborated with the Commission of Inquiry uh, to Syria through um, uh, feeding uh, visual documentation into their quarterly reports that they published about the human rights violations. And uh, this allowed us to understand more about how the UN works in this case and what kind of standards it needs for visual evidence to be able to use. And uh, right now also we are uh, planning to collaborate with the International Impartial Independent Mechanism for Syria that have started uh, last year. Uh, we are also working with uh, and collaborating with the lawyer groups such as the European Institution for Human Rights, Trial International, OSGI, CJA, and many others about creating legal court cases and understanding more how visual documentation can support their work. Uh, we have been also working uh, and collaborating with Amnesty International uh, and uh, their Digital Verification Corps team, as well as different universities, such as University of uh, uh, Berkeley, to be able to um, have a good methodology to verify materials and also go through the materials because the scale is very big and we needed a way to be able to uh, collaborate with uh, different groups to be able to go through it. And then, of course, other organizations like MIDAN and WITNESS were really important to support our uh, technical and methodological uh, work in terms of uh, video documentation and infrastructure. Uh, and, of course, this work with user-generated content will never be done without the Syrian civil society groups and civilians who, are, uh, who wanted to make sure that the world knows what's happening in Syria, as what Benna told us. Um, so, 
since, since, as I told you, since in Syria in 2011, the country was totally closed, and we depended a lot on social media and user-generated content from the first day. But with that, we faced many challenges. When we started in 2014 to be able to do this stably, we found that many of the content is being lost. It's because of different reasons. One of them is that civilians were operating in hostile environments, so they were losing it because their devices will be uh, damaged, and the whole media offices will be totally attacked, so everything will be gone in terms of information. Um, so this is one thing, and the other thing is uh, everyone is using social media, so their social media accounts were being attacked, uh, and they were getting a lot of phishing attacks uh, to be able to get into their system and then kind of silence them from publishing anything about what's happening in Syria. So this is one thing. And then the other thing is uh, they used uh, social media a lot because it was the only way for them to be able to reach a huge audience uh, to uh, kind of uh, show what's happening in the Syrian conflict. So they used Google and Facebook and so on. And then uh, last year what happened is that uh, Google have used started using machine learning systems to be able to identify content automatically uh, that is violating uh, their community guidelines. And what happened is that we saw that in two, three months, uh, about 400,000 videos have gone uh, from our database. So we can see that very clearly. So we started to raise uh, awareness about this issue with Media Atlas to just to try to make sure that um, we are able to reinstate this content, and we are able to um, you know, explain that this is a human rights content. Uh, it might have graphic imagery, but it has a lot of value for many institutions and many human rights organizations working in the Syrian conflict because they can't enter the crime scene. So there is no way. I mean, this is the only way that we can understand what's happening. Uh, and we can also kind of uh, you know, uh, use that for any type of justice processes. Um, so there has been a really good conversation with, uh, with Google. It has been done through, through Witness, uh, which was really great. And since then, we were able to instate a lot of that content. But still, until now, we see that content is being uh, lost. One of the main uh, human rights organizations in Syria called the Syrian Observatory for Human Rights have lost three of their media channels that contain thousands of videos. They have been documenting the conflict since 2011. So it's not like a group that is starting uh, right now. They have a kind of reputation, and they have been doing this for years. So this is really important to be sure that their content is still preserved. Uh, what was really helpful is that uh, Google have published their transparency report showing that how the statistics related to the automated system uh, kind of uh, uh, flagging content automatically. Uh, so, we, so we understand more and more how the, the system works and how the flagging works. So then we are able to continue the discussion with social media companies. So as I have told you, from, from our database, because we are preserving this content, we were able to um, understand how much of it has been gone. Uh, and then uh, the big speak is when uh, a lot of them have been gone in, in, last, in the end of 2017. Um, so we were able to uh, understand more the, the situation. So. Um, the Syrian Archive have, uh, since 2011, uh, preserved about 1,500,000 digital units that contain human rights violations that are happening in Syria. It's a huge number. We see how Syria is the first documented uh, war in history, and this is one of the first countries. It's going to be like this in all different countries from now on. This is how smartphones and social media technology are playing a role in this type of conflict. So it's really important to kind of create a really good uh, strategy to be able to help civil society groups make sure that this content is preserved in the best way possible from the first day, and this is what we didn't do in Syria. The second problem is related to when this content was being published. It was unsearchable. It was scattered everywhere. So it was really important for us to make sure that it's all centralized in one database, so then it's really easily uh, acquired and then uh, served into different groups that can use it in a relevant purpose. Uh, so we have created a metadata schema, and with this metadata schema, we are tagging all the visual documentation in collaboration with the groups such as uh, uh, Berkeley University, Amnesty International, and others. 
So what we are doing with this type of uh, metadata when we are um, collecting it is we are publishing collections. One of the latest collections that we have published is related to the chemical weapons attacks that happened between 2012 and 2018. Um, this is attacks that governments are uh, kind of um, not understanding the scale of it. We want to make sure that the scale of it is shown through verified visual documentation, as you can see on the screen here. So this is one of the first collections that we have published about chemical weapons. Uh, over 212 attacks, we understand from verified materials. It was more, about more than 800 videos. It was more than 190 sources uh, that are published uh, content related to these materials. And we will be continuing on doing this on different type of illegal munitions and different type of uh, uh, violations. And uh, this is how we are trying to uh, continue with our methodology of work. So this is how it looks like. Uh, all the visual documentation are in a database that can be seen in a timeline, and we are uh, doing verification the way that uh, Billing Cat also uh, is doing uh, in terms of verifying date, location, as well as, as sources. So all that is going to be put in one place to be preserved for, for the future. Uh, this is how we have been uh, doing our workflow since uh, 2014 until now. So it's starting from identifying the sources. We have more than 5,000 sources that we are collecting uh, content from and preserving that as well as uh, then we go through the uh, verification uh, kind of uh, process. Uh, the way that you know uh, has been shown in different case studies that you have seen. Once that is gone, it goes through a review and then it goes to be published, either on the database itself or uh, in uh, different uh, or feeding into different reports uh, as well as legal legal cases. So all of that can be seen in the tools and methods that the CR archive has. Uh, and uh, it's, it's all accessible online and it's all free and open source. And uh, right now what we are going uh, as, a, as a next step is we are trying to help other civil society groups in other countries use the same tools, the same methods to be able to do uh, similar work so they can preserve, verify their content, make sure that it's accessible and feeding that very quickly into uh, specific relevant processes. Uh, one of the, the last uh, challenge that we are also facing is related to scale. So Syria is the most documented uh, conflict in history. The scale of it is really huge. And for us, it was um, really overwhelming. I mean, we are about four people. Uh, right now, we are eight on a very limited budget. And uh, we had to deal with millions of digital units. So to be able to see it, to be able to verify it, to be able to use it, it was really hard. So this is why we uh, started also working with uh, Adam Harvey from, from V-Frame. And Adam Harvey created a way to be able to uh, identify specific objects that we can see in big collections. And with that, we are able to prioritize videos then to be able to go through them, verify them, and use them in Again, building criminal cases as well as advocacy and uh, also as well as transitional, transitional justice in the future. Um, so when we have these type of big collections, um, it's all preserved, it's all verified, but also it's really important to be used right now for advocacy purposes. And this is how Christina right now is going to explain to us their work using this type of materials to verify uh, and publish investigations. Thank you, Hadi. Hello, everyone. <laughs> Hello, everyone. I, I'm going to present to you very briefly the work of forensic architecture. 
Forensic Architecture is a research agency based at Goldsmiths University of London. We are a team of architects, artists, filmmakers, uh, programmers, uh, theorists, scientists, etc., etc., uh, who undertake spatial and media analysis for human rights cases. So we work with different NGOs, different human rights groups, and we present our work as evidence. We develop new evidentiary techniques and we present our work as evidence in different legal and political forums. So we might present in national courts, international courts, uh, parliamentary inquiries, the UN, but also for advocacy purposes, we work a lot with the media, we exhibit our work, so we have a kind of one-to-one -one connection with audiences as well. We always work against uh, state crime, against government crime. We always work from a civil society perspective to support claims of human rights abuses. So the first question that people have usually is what does uh, architecture have to do with forensics anyway? And so a, a very kind of brief ex explanation of that is when we consider the fact that contemporary warfare is mostly urban, when people die in buildings rather than open battlefields, then architects can somehow become a sort of a pathologist of, of buildings. So we could read the ruins of a building and we could understand what has happened. Was it an, an airstrike or was it a, a tank uh, shelling or was, it, um, was, it, uh, was the building destroyed by a bulldozer, etc., etc. So this is the first way that architects could actually start to, to conduct research on the field. In many cases, we don't have access to the site, so we have to depend very heavily on the media that comes out of it. So we have to read the architecture of the buildings um, from the media that comes out of it, from photographs and images. Uh, this was the case on um, a, a, a drone strike, a CIA drone strike in uh, Miran Shah in the ro north of Waziristan in, uh, in the Fatah area of, of Pakistan. In, uh, th this was in March 2012. And the only thing that we had to, to uh, figure out what has happened on that strike was 43 seconds of footage that was smuggled out of siege la lines because um, that area of North Waziristan is under a media siege. So there's no cameras, there's no hard drives that can go in and out. But uh, this footage was smuggled out. There were only 43 seconds of it and it was aired in MSNBC. And so we started from this, we started by geolocating this footage using similar techniques that Elliot has presented, and then using also the interior footage, we started reconstructing the space of the strike. So we analyzed it frame by frame and we moved from image into space in order to understand what it is that the space looks like. So we started reading the shrapnel marks on the walls, and by understanding the, the directionality and the shape of the shrapnel marks, we started conducting an analysis to figure out what kind of munition was used. We also started noticing some areas that were not uh, affected by shrapnel, and this was most likely the places where people have died. So we mark out those areas so that we understand uh, what is it, what, what space um, the, the bodies occupied and how they absorbed the shrapnels themselves. And so, we, again, we move from image to space and then we, we reconstructed this as a, as, a one -to, as a kind of digital model and as a one-to-one -one model where the black areas are the areas that are not covered by footage, the white is what well, is covered by footage. And what you see here is a splatter analysis where we read, again, the directionality of the shrapnel and we, we bring all of those lines together to figure out that the bomb actually detonated in mid-air. Again, we, we do this as a as a one-to-one -one installation in order to figure out exactly how um, when a shrapnel mark might be elliptical instead of uh, circular, it means that it, it, there is a, a certain directionality. And so the fact that the bomb detonated in mid-air means that it was a delayed fused bomb. It means that from the moment of impact on the roof of a building, it started counting milliseconds until it penetrated deep inside the building and it detonated in a very particular room. So this means that it is targeted munition. What, uh, so the Hellfire Romeo is a sort of architectural savvy munition. It means that it understands the architecture of buildings and it is, it is quite targeted. Um, so this is 
another way that we can we can work from the very limited sources that are available outwards in order to understand what has taken place. Um, in other cases, we have to work not only with one image, but actually many. This was the case of um, the Gaza 2014 uh, war, um, the, um, under the kind of an Israeli offensive called the Operation Protective Edge. And there we had hundreds of images and videos that were documenting one day of war. So the, that was August 1st, 2014, uh, the deadliest day of war, where almost 150 Palestinians died. But to make sense out of this huge, disparate cloud of data, we started looking at the bomb clouds. So we started looking at the top parts of, of the videos and started um, reading the morphology of the cloud as a, a very unique signifier that never repeats itself. The, the bomb cloud is, is a result of so many particular parameters that they become sort of fingerprints. So we use those, those shapes in order to both locate the strike, here we see it's, it's exactly the same strike, but also synchronize the footage with one another. This becomes useful when we have no metadata um, in one of them, but we have metadata in the other, and so the, the, the metadata itself, kind of the timestamp, can be lent to the, to the rest of them. And so, so we work with, um, with different clues. We start uh, figuring out uh, from the metadata to different uh, signifiers such as the hairline on a lens to, to figure out that those images are actually of the same time, uh, of, from the same camera, therefore the metadata, even though it's wrong, it, it's, it is comparable, it is of from, it's coming from the same source. And we build a chain of connections in order to build the narrative of events. So by linking one to the other, we, we, have, we have started locating one by one the strikes and to time them with also a technique similar to what uh, Elliot was, was uh, presenting, uh, such as shadow analysis, such as a comparison between bomb clouds, etc. The other thing that we do is also use 3D models in order to understand the spatial and temporal relationships of those kinds of evidence. So we, are, we again read the morphology of the cloud in order to, to figure out how different pieces of footage relate to one another, how they could be describing the same event. And so um, we see here that this particular bombing is connected uh, spatially and temporally uh, with another. Um, this, this is documented in, in from multiple perspectives. This was the, the biggest strike uh, of the day. There were 16 people that died there. And it is also very close um, to temporarily also to a strike of a motorcyclist. So this technique of using 3D models in order to analyze the footage and understand how it connects, how the city brings all of those together, is what we call the architectural image complex. It is a way that we could make sense and understand disparate clouds of, of data, of images, and, and through that combine it and understand how the narrative is drawn from it. Uh, we, we do this work, uh, we did it with Amnesty International in order to anchor the witness testimonies, so the voices of that particular strike, there were survivors from that strike uh, who, who testified for, for what they have seen, and we, we basically do this analytic work in order to ground their uh, testimonies. And so what, what resulted from this work is the location of hundreds of airdropped, uh, airdropped bombs and artillery, uh, all through, uh, through images. So what you see as in this kind of complex drawing, you have the black lines are the uh, photography or video um, um, angles, the blue lines are, are bomb cloud angles, and then you have uh, all of the analysis of both the, the airstrikes as well as, as, well as the ground ground disturbance from tanks or bulldozers. So we do also this kind of work in places like uh, Syria, and I think uh, Elliot will, will show some of the work we've done together. But um, I wanted to kind of end on a, on a very different uh, kind of methodology that we've developed, again for Syria. This is the case of uh, the Sednaya prison one of the most notorious places on earth. This is the um, government-run prison, the last place where, out of a series of detention centers that uh, political opposers would end up in. And in this case, we have no images. We have only this one satellite image. 
uh, but we had very few testimonies that that said that there, it's a place where people are systematically and brutally tortured. They are held under conditions of, of cold, starvation, diseases. Um, very few people escape. Thousands have disappeared since 2011. And so the only available source we had to, to understand what was happening in that place were the memories of those few people who have survived it. So, in uh, April 2016, we went to Istanbul, where five of those um, ex-detainees were now refugees. Uh, this is again a project that we did with Amnesty International, and we undertook something that is called um, acoustic and, and um, architectural modeling, what we call the architecture of memory. So we interviewed those witnesses based on 3D models, we asked them to reconstruct the place of their incar incarceration, their cells, uh, what they could remember. Because the, because the witnesses themselves had no access to any other space other than their cells, they were always confined in one space, and they had no, um, they, would, they were also no, not able to speak. There was a regime of silence in Sadnaya, so they were not allowed to speak or scream when they were being tortured. Somehow, um, the acoustic of the space became a really important part through which we reconstructed it. So we would ask them questions about the echo of, of a room in order to understand its size. We would ask questions about what was happening outside of their cell and they would understand it only from memories of, of the sounds. They would remember um, the footsteps of the guards. They would remember the kinds of sounds that each and every different torture tool would make. They could recognize what tool the guards were using based on the sound. Um, and this is just to, to, to explain how we could start reconstructing a very particular um, condition, one that is of, of constant terror and fear um, and torture. And so um, by focusing on, on um, basically the architecture of the building, we realized that people are able to remember more. So where we asked, when we were asking them to concentrate on how big the tiles were in the room or the, the textures of the walls or the dimensions of the, of the doors and the little hatches, we had one instance when we asked one of the witnesses to explain to us uh, what was the dimension of the little hatch on the door and he said the only way I can remember it is it was the size of my head and we said okay but how about the height and he was like no 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 how about the width he said no 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 the width was the size of my head because at a certain moment I was asked to place my head through this opening and I, I was beaten through it so the memory of the space itself is what brought out this this memory of torture again and the memory of the space is something that is very closely linked to um, to the experience of, of the space. We had had moments where, uh, where the witnesses would remember more details just because they were moved back into that space through, through um, the spatial reconstruction and the acoustic reco reconstruction. So um, just uh, the setup I wanted to show you that there was this, the witness would sit in the middle, there was a big screen in front of them, there was an architectural modeler on, on the right side and an acoustic investigator on their left side and basically the witness would, would uh, be completely in control of the, the testimony giving. So it would be, we would just be amplifying uh, technologically their own, uh, their own kind of um, accounts. So what this resulted in was um, a website. This is, we decided to make it into a website because it is a non-linear uh, way of storytelling because they were there for three to five years, so it is impossible to tell a single story. They, we could only capture little fragments of their experiences. And it is also an interactive space, so you are able to, to go into those, into those cells and to see how they have described it. We have both spatially and acoustically reconstructed it based on their um, testimonies. And so um, I just... Um, wanted to end by saying that those, those tools that we use, the way that we use architecture in this, in this case is as a methodological device that would allow us to assemble evidence and present it in those different forums in the most effective way possible. So I think uh, based on that, I would pass it on to Elliot to show some more work. Um, sad to say, I believe we've actually run out of time. <laughs> Thank you.
I think we've run out of time, haven't we, now, unfortunately. Unfortunately, we've uh, run out of time, so I won't be able to show you the last video, but um, I'd like to thank all our panelists.